Breaking news. We are interrupting your programming right now with more information on the execution of Thomas Creech. The Idaho Department of Correction just announced the execution was not able to proceed. Once again, Thomas Creech has not been executed. IDOC Director Josh Tewald, after consulting with the medical team leader there, determined that the medical team couldn't establish an IV line. Essentially, they couldn't find a vein where they were going to inject those drugs into Thomas Creech, so it rendered the execution unable to proceed. Mr. Creech will be returned, maybe has already returned to his cell. The witnesses have been escorted out of the facility. As a result, the death warrant will expire. So the state has to consider next steps now because they cannot do the execution later today. Again, they need to go through more of the court process to get another death warrant. Mm -hmm. Director T. Walt, state witnesses, the media as well. They're going to be at the media center shortly for a brief news conference. Now, the media witnesses, including our very own Brenda Rodriguez, are going to speak at a news conference. It is expected to start a little bit later this morning. But right now, joining us live, Morgan and Brenda together. Uh, tell us what happened. Yeah, good morning, Justin and Maggie. Just absolutely shocking. Brenda just walked through the doors a few minutes ago uh, with other media witnesses that were in the room and said it, it didn't work. It didn't go through. Thomas Creech was scheduled to be executed around 10 o'clock this morning. Uh, more than an hour later, that did not happen. Uh, Brenda, how... How were you feeling in light of that and just that news coming down, anticipating this all morning and then that being the outcome? Yeah, well, I mean, as we've mentioned before, we're there to witness what is happening at the moment. I will just say, though, they did start on time. That process did uh, start on time. We did count about seven to eight IV attempts. They started preparing, um, cleaning the, the area where it was going to be injected, and um, they, they started that at 10-7. Um, then the actual first IV went in at around like 10, 11. The last one was administered and uh, the, the officials halted the execution right at 10, 58, but we did count about seven or eight. And we say that because at one point the medical staff stopped communicating with us. Um, they were doing, uh, they were very great at communicating throughout all the IV processes. But after that sixth one, we didn't really get a lot of communication. So we're saying about seven or eight um, IV injections at the time. And that number is not confirmed, but it's, of course, what you witnessed. Um, when did they then communicate to you that it was not working and they were going to be done attempting for the morning? Yeah, well, it was at 10.58. They would tell us when they had an unsuccessful IV after each attempt. But at 10.58, that's when they called it, saying um, the, the execution was halted. What was the reaction in the room? I think it was just shock. Um, we did not expect that to happen. We were just told that this was happening today, but um, after each attempt, it, you know, we, we started seeing those, those responses from uh, the, the medical staff. I will actually note that um, while the medical staff were administering, they were a little shaky. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that I picked on. Um, at the, the entire time, Creech was reaching out to um, his family, just reaching out, uh, saying, uh, you know, waving at them, nodding. Um, every time the IV was inserted, though, he would make some snoring noises, mm -hmm. and then he'd twitch as well. And that would happen after each attempt. So what they've said is they were unable to find an IV line, correct? That's correct, yeah. And that happened seven or eight times, uh, that attempt rather. Um, you know, there was a point, everything, it didn't seem like he was in pain throughout most of the time. There was one time, though, that he said, uh, quote, my legs hurt a bit. Mm -hmm. um, that's where the medical staff helped lift his legs. He was a little bit more comfortable after that is what he shared. Um, but other than that, that was the only time that it looked like he was in pain. Were you able to see him get taken away from that chamber? Yeah. Uh, well, no. Uh, let me go back here. Uh, we were actually escorted out of the, the room before uh, uh, Creech was, was removed as well. Anything else he said that stuck out to you? Yeah, there was this moment before he got there, he would mumble um, a lot of words. Some you can make out, some you didn't. Um, I did catch, too, at the very beginning when he was first brought in, he said, what appeared to me, he said, I'm sorry, um, looking at his family. Uh, another time, he said, I love you to his family, and that was after a couple of attempts. 
and his wife and his stepson were there. Those were the two family members present, correct? So we, that's what we were told, um, but we were not able to see them. We did have to sign in um, to get into the facility. I did see his wife's name um, listed there. So uh, that's as far as I know. We are expecting the state witnesses, and there are several of them, including the Ada County prosecutor, uh, representative from Governor Little's office, Attorney General Raul Labrador, to come in momentarily and discuss what happened in there. But can you give us uh, the lay of the land? What what was the witness experience like, the, the execution chamber itself? How was it all laid out? Yeah, I mean, we had four, uh, all four media witnesses were up front. We had uh, five chairs right behind us. That's where we had uh, Governor Little's uh, staff members, the AG. Uh, uh, I did see Raul Labrador um, before entering the execution chamber, but I did not see him inside the chamber itself. So his representative was in there, though. Were you separated in a different room than, like you said, his family and, and others who were there? Uh, yes, yeah. So we actually were not um, able even to see his his family. There was a wall right in be, uh, between us, and then they were separated in the other room. But we both had um, access to the viewing area, the, the windows there. And in the execution chamber itself, it was just Mr. Creech and the medical staff that was administering the lethal injection? So it was actually also his uh, spiritual advisor was in the corner at all times. Um, he did step out a couple times, um, but for the most part, he was at, uh, in the corner. Um, I will also notice uh, one of the other things that stuck out to me, because it was so many attempts, uh, the medical staff, one of the members stepped out to go get more needles, what appeared to look like needles, um, and then brought them back into continue attempting the IVs. Wow. You just can't imagine what's going through everybody's head at this point in the process. Um, we do know the drug is pentobarbital. That's been in court filings. That is the lethal injection drug that they were using this morning. Uh, all we know about that drug is that it had an expiration date of February 2025 and that it had been manufactured. We don't know whether the state got it from a veterinary source, whether they got it from a source from within the United States or outside the United States from a company that has potentially been bankrupt at this point. Uh, Idaho is actually shielded. The Department of Correction is shielded from uh, providing any of that information under a new law that was passed a couple of years ago. So those are some questions that we'll have today, certainly for the Department of Correction and for state leaders, but not sure that those questions will be answered. Brenda, is there anything else that stuck out to you that you want to note? Yeah, well, at the very end when the execution was halted, um, he was just looking up, Creech was just looking up. He kept mumbling a couple words that I could not make out. Um, and also felt, it felt to, uh, like he was almost in relief, like yeah. just yeah. mumbling some words, just looking up. And that's the last of, of what I saw of him. Wow. All right. Again, just to recap, the Idaho Department of Corrections saying this morning that the planned execution of 73-year-old Thomas Creech, who was on death row for murdering a fellow inmate, David Jensen, back in uh, the 80s, is no longer going to be executed. That death warrant has expired. They would need to go through all proper channels and steps in the court process to get another death warrant. Those are, again, questions we're going to ask about coming up when they have that news conference here at the Department of Correction Complex. Maggie and Justin, back to you. All right, thank you, you too. Morgan, Brenda, please stay there live for us. Bre uh, Brenda and Morgan, I do wanna mention something about the medical team. Now, these are documents that relate to an execution here in Idaho, and the medical team consists of volunteers whose training and experience include administering intravenous or IV drips. To serve on this team, you must meet the following criteria. At least three years of medical experience as an emergency medical tech, EMT, a licensed practical nurse, military corpsman, paramedic, phlebotomist, which we know is important when you're trying to find a line there, maybe a PA, a physician, a registered nurse. So these people are in fact qualified, have current venous access proficiency, current uh, pharmacodynamics proficiency, that means you understand medical orders, labels, draw medications, and deliver medications through either an injection or an IV. And this is where the problem was this morning, and be certified in CPR. So there is a lot that goes into this, and they want to make sure this medical team is qualified. They met these 
uh, qualifications, but apparently just too tough to find a vein or get the line in or something of that nature. Hopefully during this news conference, we'll learn more. Yeah, they absolutely seem like they would be experts as Brenda said though. And again, we need to say she not a medical expert, but did yes. notice that there might have been some trembling there. This is obviously something that I, high pressure you would very high pressure. Yes. You wouldn't imagine uh, probably anyone on this team has done before unless they were on the teams um, where Idaho put to death two inmates, one in 2011, one in 2012. But we have no indication that that's the case. So this something that, that could very much affect them. I talked to Rebecca Boone about that yes. yesterday, uh, the AP reporter who's witnessed three different executions. And she absolutely said, yeah, those images will never leave me. Mm -hmm. She said it's never going to leave the, the staff either, the medical team yeah. who performs these executions. I think we yeah. saw that here today. Um, just looking up, at least one Stanford study said that lethal injection actually is uh, one of the least reliable uh, ways to execute an inmate. They roughly say that uh, botched execution rate, a little more than 7%. That can include a lot of things. Even having trouble finding a vein could be considered a botch, um, even though if you eventually find that and the injection goes forward, uh, not the case here today. As Brenda said, they tried six, maybe seven times, at least from what she observed. And they couldn't establish that IV line to then inject those lethal injection drugs. Likely didn't happen another time. She did say that they were escorted out yes. before Creech was out. But then she heard that, that they called it shortly, even just... Um, According to IDOC director Josh T. Walt, she said they were escorted out about two minutes before 11 a.m. this morning when it looked like they couldn't establish that line. And then it looked like uh, director T. Walt called it just two minutes later at 11 a.m. that uh, they could not establish that IV line. So they couldn't proceed with the execution. And it's important to remember these are volunteers. The medical team is volunteer base so it's not like they're part of the state on the payroll or any of the thing of that nature they are volunteers in there doing this work in a very high pressure situation to get that right to absolutely get it right so let's recap what's happened up until now this morning during the morning show we told you that Creech was scheduled to be put to death after the U.S. Supreme Court denied a stay just two hours before the scheduled execution and it looks like we're about to hear now from uh, IDOC Director T. Walton, just exactly what happened there today. They're about to start that news conference right now. No, Morgan and Brenda are live for us. They have some more information. Okay. Morgan, Brenda. Yeah, hey, Maggie and Justin, we are still waiting for those state officials uh, to arrive from the execution area to the media center, which is quite a bit of ways away. Uh, Brenda and other media witnesses that were in the room have returned to the media center and uh, it was it was just audible gasps and, and shock around the room when they came in and said that the execution did not go through as you guys mentioned we had anticipated this for quite some time now he had his clemency hearing back in january uh, the, the asks for a stay, even so far as a couple hours ago from the U.S. Supreme Court, were, were rejected. And so we were fully anticipating Thomas Creech to be executed this morning, the first person in Idaho to be executed in more than a decade uh, who was sitting on death row. And he has been in an Idaho prison for about half a century now. But again, that death warrant uh, has expired because he was not executed this morning. Brenda, you were in there for more than an hour. What was it like after it was announced that this wasn't gonna happen? Well, I think everyone was just in shock at that moment, right? I mean, there's a seven to eight attempts of IV injection there um, that resulted unsuccessful. So um, I also wanted to quickly mention, um, because Maggie and Justin talked about the medical staff there and them being volunteers, but what I did notice is that uh, they were a little shaky at yeah. that time. Um, well, when a Creech rolled in, um, he seemed uneasy. He uh, seemed nervous, um, but all he could do is just, his eyes were glued to his family. He was strapped uh, on that, uh, from the gurney over to the table, and he, he just couldn't keep his eyes and in, in, uh, face looking over at uh, his family. And like you said, seven or eight attempts potentially were waiting on that exact number from the Department of Correction, but you said they 
maybe even had to leave the room to potentially go get more needles as well? Yeah, well, there was a point, though. We say seven or eight because at one point, uh, the medical staff was no longer communicating with us exactly what was happening. Um, they were doing so well for a, a, most of the attempts, but once we got into that seventh and eighth attempt. Um, that's where it got a little uh, foggy for us. But yes, at one point, the medical staff had to leave the room uh, and it, what it looked like uh, get to get some needles when they came back, they had a, a couple of them um, laid out there on their table as well. And for those of you just joining us, we talked to Brenda a few moments ago, but Brenda, I'll ask you those same questions again. Uh, what did you hear from him throughout the morning? And then, of course, after he was told that this wasn't going to work? Yeah, well, he did make a couple of comments. Um, nothing, some, most of it rather, you couldn't really make out because he was just mumbling words. Um, I did catch two of them at the very beginning uh, before that first uh, IV was inserted. He said, I'm sorry. Um, after a, a, a couple of attempts, that is, he said, I love you. This was all directed to his family. There was one point, though, where he made direct eye contact over to us and um, didn't really do much, didn't really say anything, but just looked at us, and then he just laid back down. We're obviously not allowed to have cameras inside that room as this is occurring. What did he look like? And you spoke to a reporter yesterday who used to work for KTVB who followed him throughout his criminal process once he was convicted of those crimes in, in Donnelly where he murdered two individuals and then of course when he killed David Jensen in prison for which he was on death row for. Uh, was he what you expected after talking to that former KTVB reporter yesterday? You know, he, uh, when I spoke to Roger Simmons, I mean, he mentioned that most of his conversations were just comfortable. He was an easy man to talk to. And uh, truly that, it felt like that. It really mm -hmm. did feel um, like he was a nice guy, like Roger Simmons would, uh, would describe him. Um, one of the things that he did mention though, is during his interviews uh, back in uh, the late eighties, uh, he said, this is not the way that I want to be executed. He did. He says he did not. He does not like needles. Um, so that was one of the things that I was looking for directly to see how he reacted to that. Most of the time, like I said, he was just glued to his family. Um, didn't even look at the medical staff when when they started injecting. Um, so yeah, he was just looking directly to his family. I thought it was really interesting in your story last night, and for those of you at home who haven't seen it, it aired in the 10 o'clock newscast, and you can find it on our website. Uh, he had said to the camera back in the 80s, I'm ready to die. Did you watch the rest of that interview and, and what he said in follow-up to that? Yeah, well, Roger Simmons did talk to him afterwards. This is after, uh, I believe, the last time that he was uh, put back on death row for, for Jensen. Um, and he did say that he changed his mind. He did not want to be executed anymore. He said that God had forgiven him for everything that he'd done. Um, so really, he didn't want to uh, be executed at that time. I don't know if that has changed now. We haven't been able to talk to him. The last time we did um, was in 81. So... So he had said, I am ready, and then had changed his mind and said, I'm not ready. And it's important to note, um, like we said, this case has played out for more than 40 years, almost half a century that Thomas Creech has been in an Idaho prison. He's been convicted of five murders. The one for which he's on death row for here in Idaho was the murder of David Jensen, a fellow inmate. Um, and he beat him with a sock full of batteries. And that was at the time that he was serving a life sentence for the double murder of two painters in Donnelly that he committed in the 70s. Now, for those murders, he was originally sentenced to death, but that sentence was commuted to life in prison once the Supreme Court barred automatic death sentences. So he'd already been sentenced to death and convicted of other murders. That had been taken back, and then he was sentenced to death again, like I mentioned, for Mr. Jensen. And we do know that Mr. Jensen, the victim, did not have any family today witnessing this. Right. I, we, don't, we didn't get any of that information. Um, we weren't told that. So at, at this time, it's unknown, really. But from what we were told originally, I and mean, we all know this information, uh, they, they were not here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I doc confirmed. Sonda with the communications department did confirm this morning. Jensen did not have any family here. But like you said, Creech did. Uh, it was his wife and his stepson, correct? So we weren't actually able to see the other room where they were in. Um, we were told that they were going to be there. We did not get confirmation if they were actually there. Uh, but what we uh, did have to check in prior to um, entering the facility. And I did see her name listed there as being checked in. His wife, Leanne. His wife, yes. Okay. Did you see any other state witnesses that we know we're going to hear from this morning? 
Um, so no, uh, not on that sheet in particular, but inside uh, we did have representative from the AG office, La Raul uh, Labrador was there as well, representative from the governor's office was, uh, was there. Um, I will mention though, Raul, uh, he was at the um, briefing um, uh, meeting there and then we did not see him inside the, the chamber itself, yeah. I know you laid this out for us, but like I said, for those of you just joining us at home, how was the room laid out and what did you experience? What was that whole process like for you guys? Yeah, so the four media witness were right up front, just regular folded chairs, um, four up front, and then towards the back, we had five of them for the people that we just mentioned. Um, two of them were, were empty, two seats. And then at the end, you guys were escorted out before Mr. Creech was. Yes, so we were told that the execution was halted. That happened at 10.58. Um, after that, uh, we were actually escorted out of the room and Creech uh, stayed behind. Um, you could just see him look up to the sky, uh, to the, to the uh, roof, really, and just mumble a couple of words. Not really sure what he said, but it almost seemed like he was in relief. All right, Brenda Rodriguez, one of the four media witnesses in there this morning for that execution. Again, that did not happen, and that death warrant for Mr. Creech has now expired. Uh, it is back to figuring out what next steps are for the state of Idaho. We are waiting to hear from state officials here at the Media Center momentarily. We will bring you that press conference both live on air and online. Maggie and Justin. And Morgan and Brenda, we have some brand new information from our friend Rebecca Boone from the Associated Press. She says Creech's attorneys have immediately filed a new motion for a stay in U.S. District Court saying, quote, given the badly botched execution attempt this morning, which proves IDOC's inability to carry out a humane and constitutional execution, undersigned counsel preemptively seek an emergency stay of execution to prevent any further attempts today. It's also important to note that Idaho's prison director said the medical team could not establish that IV line, we've talked about that, to administer the deadly drug. A team of three medical team members tried repeatedly to establish an IV attempting sites, Rebecca says, in both of Creech's arms and both of his legs. And we talked about the qualifications that that medical yes. team needed to have, really, I think, experts in those fields. This very a different situation, though, for everyone there at Idaho's maximum security prison. Um, Idaho has not executed a prisoner since 2012. Other states, this is much more common, and they have teams, whether you like it or not, who are much more experienced uh, with this. Texas had five executions last year, Missouri four, Oklahoma three, Florida six. Again, Idaho hadn't executed anyone since 2012, so a long time. Creech been on death row for nearly 50, 50 years 50 years now and Maggie as you pointed out uh, this is now the 12th time yes. that I believe a death warrant was issued. was issued and, and now there will be a 13th uh, I mean, if it, if not, it moves forward. not of his lawyers have anything so to do with it. So that's true. Yes. So let's let's go into the history of the death penalty here in Idaho just a little bit while we wait for that news conference to begin. We hope to hear from the warden and other people there on site. But Idaho is one of 21 states where capital punishment is legal. The rest either don't have it or have it on pause. 23 states have no death penalty. Six are on pause. Creech will be the 30th person to be executed here in Idaho if it does move forward. Right now we know this execution attempt was not successful today. He is back in his cell. Now, Hector Mendoza has been live for us all morning out there outside of the prison where protesters had started together about 9 a.m. with the expected execution at 10 a.m. Hector, live for us now out there. Hector, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? Well, right now we don't have anybody out here. I think around maybe about a half hour ago to about a little bit more than that it has since cleared out so some of these people aren't here anymore but earlier this morning i did get a chance to speak to some of the protesters and they had mentioned that um one of the things that they were looking forward to is being physic physically here to be able to let the people of idaho know that this is not the right way to go about this and there was a lot of sentiment in terms of being able to gather here there was dozens of people here so here's what people had to say when it came to uh just kind of their opposition to the death penalty and particularly this execution. When you truly believe in something, when something is passionate as my faith is against killing, against the death penalty, um, 
it's we need we need to get out of our homes we need to get out of our spaces that provide us comfort and this is a cold day it's not a pleasant day to be out but it's it's a day that we just need to physically show that we're against something and i'm not sure if the people that left in terms of the protesters knew that the execution didn't go through today, but I, like I mentioned about maybe 30, possibly 45 minutes ago, a lot of these people just kind of cleared out. There's not many people here in terms of those protesters, but, um, but again, I think one of the things that they wanted to make sure that people know is that this, this was not the way to go about this, but um, who knows if they, they do know or they don't know about what happened here today. Justin yeah. Maggie? They may have left before that was even announced. Thank you, Hector. And I do want to mention a few more things about the protests that we did see today. Leaders of Idaho's Catholic, Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopal, Unitarian, and Jewish communities, faith leaders, civil rights advocates, they expressed visible and audible protests at the scheduled time of the execution that we all know now did not happen. They say there can be no business as usual on an execution day. This is why the phones will not stop ringing today at Governor Little's office and why Idahoans everywhere will hear from their faith leaders and from the bell towers of their churches. This is from, of course, the people who are against the death penalty. Now, there were uh, protests at the entrance of the prison complex, at the bell in front of the Idaho State Capitol, and there was even a live virtual execution vigil where they gathered uh, death penalty opponents from across Idaho and beyond and did that online as well. And churches across Idaho are participating at ForWhomTheBellsToll.org. That's a project tolling their bells for two minutes at the scheduled time of what was supposed to be the execution today. But we just got another statement in, Justin, from... This from the Federal mm -hmm. Defender Services of Idaho. So yes. public defenders um, who helped in some way defend Mr. Thomas Creech, they say, quote, we are angered but not surprised that the state of Idaho botched the execution of Thomas Creech today. They say, this is what happens when unknown individuals with unknown training are assigned to carry out an execution. This morning they tried and failed. They say here, 10 times to access Tom's veins in both of his arms and legs so they could inject him with the state's mysteriously acquired pentobarbital. More on that in a second. This is precisely the kind of mishap we warned the state and the courts could happen when attempting to execute one of the country's oldest death row inmates and circumstances completely shielded in secrecy despite a well-known history of getting drugs from shady sources. Again, this is a quote from the Federal Defender Services of Idaho. Yesterday, the state... They continue, yesterday the state called Mr. Creech's worries patently absurd in its motions to the U.S. Supreme Court. Unfortunately, what is absurd is Idaho's continuing efforts to kill this, they say, harmless old man who by this point surely has suffered enough, end quote. They continually mention sort of mysteriously acquired lethal injection drugs. That's really what happened, started in 2019 when a number of drug manufacturers said they would no longer provide drugs to states, these something like pentobarbital, if the state would potentially use it for a lethal injection. So the Federal Defender Services of Idaho and Thomas Creech's lawyers yes. have argued for a while that the state got these drugs from a shady source, something else, perhaps the drugs uh, they believe were meant to be used on animals, not humans. They did not believe that was legal. So they continue that argument here. Well, as we mentioned, his attorneys immediately filed the new motion for a stay in U.S. District Court saying, once again, given this badly botched execution attempt this morning, which proves IDOC's inability to carry out a humane and constitutional execution, undersigned counsel preemptively seek an emergency stay of execution to prevent any further attempts today. We really don't know what's going to happen next. We are waiting for this news conference to find out. This is unprecedented, I think. I mean, we'd have to look back in our records, but um, as long as I've been here at Channel 7 and seen two executions in the past, they went off without a hitch. There were no issues. So right. this was really a shock to all of us in the newsroom this morning. We thought it was over, and then we got word that an IV line was not able to be managed. They couldn't get it going, and so this did not happen. And again, it, it seems like uh, the state as well is unsure about what to do next. I'm yes. sure it's unprecedented for many of them. The latest statement we have from the state was 
we're looking at what we have to do next. We're looking at possible next steps because yes. they they were set to execute Creech. He would have been the 30th person executed in Idaho's history. Again, yes. that did not happen, could not establish an IV line. He's been taken back to his cell. Um, as you said, his lawyers are, are appealing again now um, against that death penalty. Um, we go now live again to yeah. Morgan and Brenda who are down live right there outside of Idaho, Max Brenda was in a viewing room right next to that execution chamber. Morgan, Brenda. Good morning, Maggie and Justin. Brenda was one of four media witnesses. There were several state witnesses there as well. Um, I do want to note, you guys just touched on some of the major points there uh, with the facts that we know from the Department of Correction so far, but important to point out, that death warrant will expire for Thomas Creech, who has been on death row for decades, has been... Uh, attempted to be executed 11 times now. There was a warrant for execution last year, uh, then his clemency hearing, which his stay was denied. And so we were, everybody was anticipating today was going to be the day. And now they have to go back to the drawing board. I'll bring in Brenda Rodriguez now again as one of the media witnesses in that room. Brenda, what was his demeanor like the second he walked in the door into that execution chamber? From what I can tell, he was nervous. He was uneasy of what was going on. But one of the biggest things, though, the entire time he was, his eyes and, and his position was was uh, just glued to his family, which was just right in front of him. Mm -hmm. um, we were a little bit towards the left-hand side of him, um, towards the bottom, um, and his family or uh, his family was in the other room. So we didn't really get to see the family. Um, we just got to see his interaction more so, just uh, mumbling words to them. Two phrases that I was able to catch was, um, I'm, I'm sorry, um, this happened before the first IV was administered, and then um, I love you. And that was after several attempts. You counted potentially seven or eight. Yeah, so it was about seven or eight, and that's because at one point the medical staff stopped communicating with us. Um, they were doing so well at the beginning with every attempt, um, but uh, it got to a point where we it was a little foggy at that point. They stopped communicating. They stepped out of the room to go get some more material. When they came in, it looked like it was more needles, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Where did they attempt to put that IV line, those multiple IV lines? Yeah, so they did start with the left or with the arms uh, first. After those failed, they did a couple attempts there. They went straight to uh, the leg areas. Mm -hmm. um, and I will mention, uh, Morgan, uh, this whole process, it didn't seem like he was in pain. Mm -hmm. There was just one moment that he did say that his feet were hurting. Mm -hmm. um, the medical staff were, uh, were able to help him out a little bit to find comfort. Um, but that was the only, other, uh, the only time, ra rather, that I really saw him in pain. How was he positioned? Walk us through this for, for those of us who have never even seen, you know, even photos, because a lot of times cameras are not allowed in these chambers. Um, was he strapped down to something and how was the room laid out? Yeah, so in the room um, you had, well, he walked in, or he, uh, rather, he was brought in at 10 o'clock, so it started on time. Um, he was in, an, in the gurney, um, then he was, and he was strapped there. Uh, his arms, his, uh, his uh, legs, everything was strapped. His uh, body was also strapped. He was then put on top of the chair uh, where he was again strapped um, on both of his wrists. So a lot of straps really went into this. Um, and uh, right up in front of it, you did have the podium um, where the staff were able to make a couple comments. That's where the halted uh, comment came, came through. And then at the corner towards the very uh, back of the room, that's where we saw his spiritual uh, advisor. Okay, Brian Tom, I believe is his name, and I know he got time with him this morning, and he was in the room with Thomas the entire time with Mr. Creech? He was. Uh, I was surprised to see that he was just in a corner, though. He wasn't with him, um, or at least we didn't get as far uh, to the point where maybe he, he was able to approach him and be close to him. Um, but yeah, he was just in the corner. He did step out a couple times, um, but he would always come back. And this execution chamber was at the Idaho Maximum Security Institution where he was housed, correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And, and what were the witness areas? How were those laid out? Yeah. So we had four uh, chairs up front, right in front of the glass windows. Um, that's where the media, including myself, we were uh, we were sat there. Right behind us, there was about five chairs. Um, two of them are empty. Um, and then we've already talked about who was there with us. Uh, but uh, 
I will mention Raul Labrador. We did get to see him uh, when we were getting briefed before entering the chamber, um, and then we didn't see him after that. Okay. So again, I think if I'm recalling correctly, maybe six state witnesses and then four witnesses from the media. What was that feeling like in the room after you were told, and how were you told that this wasn't going to work? Just shocked. I think like the rest of us uh, receiving this news, um, we were just expecting for those next steps and we didn't get there. So yeah, just shocked. How many medical providers did you see there? Yeah, there was about uh, three administering um, the IVs. Um, and then you had a, a couple staff members there and then um, the, the police department as well. Okay. Uh, could you recall off the top of your head how many individuals other than his spiritual advisor and Mr. Creech were in the room with him? Yeah, at one point there was three of them, or I'm sorry, uh, nine of wow. them, yes. Okay. And we know, all we know is that the drug that they were planning on using was pentobarbital. Uh, Idaho is shielded under a law that went into effect from disclosing where they got the lethal injection drugs, how they got them. Uh, his federal defenders have asked multiple times. Were these from a veterinary source? Were these from outside the country? Were these from a shady source within the country, potentially a company that went bankrupt? We will certainly ask those questions of the state this morning, but we don't know that we're going to get those answers. We don't know exactly what they're going to say, but as we mentioned, it is back to the drawing board. It is now figuring out next steps, and this is, of course, going to have to play out through the legal system. I mean, decades of appeals even an overnight 11th hour attempt from his federal defenders to try to stay this execution through a petition to the U.S. Supreme Court asking that Mr. Creech not be executed this morning. And now you've got to go through multiple hoops again, and they've got to go back to court, whether it's state or federal courts, um, to go ask for another death warrant, uh, them being the state. So. We will continue to stay here. We are expecting this news conference from state leaders, uh, from the Ada County prosecutor right here in the media center at about noon, and we will bring that to you live on air and online. Maggie and Justin. All right, we'll get back to you with that as soon as we can. Well, and Morgan, Brenda, thank you. And as we've mentioned, Creech has been convicted in the murders of five different people. Now, he said, though, he killed at least 42 people in his lifetime, though that claim never been confirmed. Here's what we do know about the deaths for which he has been convicted and his victims. In June 1974, the body of 50 year old Vivian Robinson, a state tax auditor, was found in their home in Sacramento, California. Investigators say the body was found so badly decomposed, no cause of death was originally announced. In October of 1975, investigators were able to link Creech's fingertips to the crime. Years later, it was revealed Robinson was suffocated. Two months later, 22-year-old William Dean was found shot to death inside a church in Portland, Oregon. It's the same church where Creech once worked as a sexton. Creech later admitted to the killing. In early November, the bodies of two men were found in a ditch near Donnelly, Idaho. 34-year-old Edward Arnold of Texas and 40-year-old John Bradley of Alabama had been shot to death. Creech and his then-girlfriend, 17-year-old Carol Spaulding from Lewiston, were later arrested and charged with murder. Creech reportedly told officers he, quote, shot the men after they made improper advances to Miss Spaulding. Spaulding eventually pleaded guilty to accessory to murder. She was sentenced to two years in prison, while behind bars, she gave birth to a baby boy, Ben. In 1981, while serving his life sentence for the deaths of the two men in Valley County, Creech beat a fellow inmate, 23-year-old David Dale Jensen, to death with a sock full of batteries. The two were exercising in the maximum security institution in CUNA when the warden said Jensen, quote, was slugged on the head by a homemade weapon consisting of flashlight batteries wrapped in a stocking. He was taken to a hospital where he later died. He was there serving a three-year term for grand theft. And again, if you're just joining us, Tom and Thomas Creech was scheduled to be executed at 10 a.m. this morning, but they failed to establish an IV line. He has been sent back to his cell. The death warrant has expired, so he will not be executed today. A lot of people wondering what in the world happens next because mm -hmm. this is so unprecedented, especially in the state of Idaho. There's no reason to believe anything like this has ever happened. Only three uh, lethal injections have taken place in the past more than half of a yeah. century. Before that, in the late 50s, um, they executed d death warrants by hanging. So yeah. 
This is the only time this has ever happened in the state of Idaho. A botched lethal injection on Thomas Creech this morning. Right now, he is still alive, back in his cell. And you know, uh, our friend Rebecca Boone at the AP uh, wrote about this. She said the IV sites appeared to be in the crook of his arms, his hands near his ankles and in his feet. At one point, the medical cart holding supplies was moved in front of the media. Witness uh, viewing window, partially obscuring the view of the medical team's efforts so they couldn't see it at that time. A team member also had to leave the execution chamber to gather more supplies. Our Brenda Rodriguez spoke to that as well. Uh, Creech was wheeled into the room on a gurney at 10 a.m., ready to go. The warden announced he was halting the execution at 10.58, so they did try for an hour in uh, several different locations on Creech to get a vein and get the medication into his veins. That did not happen. And there's no reason to believe that they could. So to clarify, the death warrant actually expires at 1159 tonight. They did not believe that they could find an IV line, that they could uh, execute Mr. Creech um, anytime this afternoon any reason for them to try again. As you can see, we're going to hopefully get more information right now from uh, IDOC leaders. They're just about ready to start that news conference from right outside the maximum security prison. There's uh, IDOC director Josh T. Walt. I don't think he's ready to go just yet. Just as soon as he is, we will, of course, take his mic live for you so you can hear exactly what he has to say and what happened this morning. But we do want to mention Creech's attorneys immediately filed a new motion for a stay in U.S. District Court saying, given the badly botched execution attempt this morning, which proves IDOC's inability to carry out a humane and constitutional execution, undersigned counsel preemptively seek an emergency stay of execution to prevent any further attempts today. Now, there are a lot of unanswered questions out there. We have them, too. I'm sure you're wondering as well, and uh, we're hoping to get those answers as soon as they get settled here. We do have our team there. We have Hector on scene. We have Morgan. We have Brenda. We have our photojournalists as well, and we're trying to gather this information for you today. But once again, just a stunner for everyone here in the community who's watching this today, wondering what went wrong this morning with the planned execution of 73-year-old Thomas Creech. He has been imprisoned since 1974, convicted of five murders in three states and suspected of a whole lot more. Justin mentioned he has claimed 42, then he backtracked that to 20-something. But regardless, uh, a lot of victims in his wake. And let's uh, listen Josh in. Josh Walt. I'm the director for the Idaho Department of Correction. Um, let me give a, a quick recount of events uh, from today, um, uh, starting with, with what I think most of you are most eager to hear about. Uh, earlier this morning, our medical team did a physical assessment of Mr. Creech. Uh, after that assessment, they had communicated uh, to me as well as Warden, uh, Warden Richardson that, that they believed and had confidence that they would be able to establish venous access on Mr. Creech. Uh, once Mr. Creech was escorted into the execution chamber uh, and was strapped down, the medical team entered and attempted to establish IV access. Uh, the team uh, attempted eight times. Uh, through multiple limbs and appendages uh, to establish IV access consistent with IDOC's policy. Uh, it's worth noting uh, in our conversations with the medical team afterwards that what they encountered in some instances was an access issue, uh, but in others where they could establish uh, access, they were unable, uh, it was a vein quality issue uh, that made them not confident in their ability to administer chemicals through the IV site once established. Uh, consistent with our training and with our protocols, uh, we, uh, from the very beginning, try to be very candid and upfront that this isn't a do-it-at-any-cost process, that our first objective is to carry this out with dignity, professionalism, and respect. Uh, and part of that was training and practicing uh, for the chance that they were unable to establish IV access. Uh, once the medical team leader had determined that it would be unlikely uh, that they were going to be able to establish IV access, uh, that was when we halted the execution. Um, 
Mr. Creech at this time is back in his cell in F block. Uh, we are planning to allow the death warrant to expire because we don't anticipate a change in status or circumstance that would allow us to continue with the execution today. Uh, we don't have an idea of time frames or next steps at this point. Uh, those are things we will be discussing in the days ahead. Um, and once we have, once the state has determined the next course of action, we'll certainly uh, make those actions known in the appropriate venue. Uh, while I'm here, and, and I'll certainly defer to uh, the media witnesses to recount their experiences, uh, I do want to take a second to talk about uh, the confidence of our medical team and our confidence in them. Uh, as part of our training and rehearsals uh, for this, uh, every, every single member of our administrative team, including myself, uh, this is a team of competent medical professionals and we've allowed them to establish IV access on each of us individually. Uh, we train for a number of different scenarios and potential outcomes uh, and, and my confidence in this team just could not be higher. Uh, it's also worth noting that when you look at our SOP, the, the qualifications uh, that, that our medical team has, these are people uh, who in their day jobs, uh, people's lives depend on their ability to establish an IV. Uh, so our confidence in them remains high and, and, and while the execution was unsuccessful, I think their efforts were, uh, I think it would be wrong to call it a failure. They did their level best in a professional way uh, that was respectful of the process. And when it, when it appeared that those efforts were going to be unsuccessful, they did the right thing and opted to stop additional efforts uh, so that we could evaluate next steps. Um, with that, uh, I will uh, stop for a moment and allow the other witnesses to speak to their particular uh, experiences. And then I'm happy to answer any questions after that. Hello, I'm Rebecca Boone. I'm a correspondent with the Associated Press. I'll attempt to do sort of a minute-by-minute -minute recount of what we saw so that you can understand what happened. Um, let's see. So the media witnesses were brought into the witness room at 9.50 this morning. Um, we were in there with um, several other people, including Hayden Dodds uh, from the Board of Correction, Jared Larson from the governor's office, um, there was a correctional officer in there with us in Ada County Sheriff Clifford. Um, at 9.55, it sounded to me as if perhaps Mr. Creech's witnesses were being brought into the room, just so you understand that it is a separate witness room and we are not able to see them. They have their own window into the execution chamber. So what we can see when we sit in there is the execution chamber itself, which has a padded sort of medical style table with straps on it a podium where the warden stands, um, two phones, one red, one black, and then in the walls there are some holes where the IV tubing goes into the medication room or the medical team room, which is actually behind the execution chamber and is not visible to us. The medical team um, apparently views Mr. Creech throughout the process, the ones that aren't in the execution room, via some um, closed circuit cameras, I think, and it, I saw two cameras or three cameras above the medical table itself. So that is where I presume they were viewing the events. Um, at 9.59 9 this morning, I heard some faint pounding from outside our room. It's not clear what that pounding was. It sounded like somebody sort of rhythmically banging on metal. Um, I do not know what that sound was. It lasted for a few minutes and then stopped. At 10 a.m., um, the warden and the director and um, some correctional officers entered the execution room, followed um, almost immediately by uh, the escort team, which was six people um, escorting Mr. Creech in. He was already on a gurney. Um, they brought him in. They moved him via a backboard to the execution table and then began strapping him down, um, first his right arm, then his left. Uh, he seemed fairly he was not moving much during this process. He wasn't fidgeting. Um, the escort team was standing at attention when they weren't actively strapping him down. And that placement of him on the table was complete by 10.03. Um, once he was on the table, he was looking at people in his witness area, which was adjacent to ours, um, and appeared to be talking or mouthing some things. 
Um, at 10.04 about, the medical team began assessing um, his veins and, a, and applying an EKG to his, test, to his chest to monitor his heart rate. Um, and they took several steps to uh, sort of prepare his arm, his right arm for access to the IV. Um, they used devices including like a, like a laser device or an infrared device, a vein finder tool. They used a hot compress. Um, they attached a blood pressure cuff that they inflated to try to get the veins to distend. Um, so by about 10.11, they began trying to establish the first IV. And within two minutes, at 10.13, they decided the first IV attempt was unsuccessful. They again tried a new site. They each, each IV step took several steps, right? So they would clean the skin, they would um, up, inject a numbing agent, they would re-clean the skin, um, and then they would attempt to insert the IV itself. Excuse me. IVs continued to be attempted in each arm first. So they tried the right arm first, they tried the hand, they tried the left arm, both sides, and then they decided that they needed to move to his legs. Um, and at that point, they removed the sheet that was covering his legs, took off his orange, uh, like slide-on style shoes, um, pulled up the, his green scrub style pants, and then worked around the um, hook and loop style straps that were restraining both of his ankles. At that point, they moved the medical cart that they were using to hold their supplies to near Mr. Creech's feet, so it would be next to where they were working. This obscured our view partially, and we were unable to see exactly how many attempts directly that they were trying. However, based on the number of times they inflated the cuff and used numbing agents, our count was also eight attempts. Oh, let's see. So by 1043, they were still, oh sorry, at 1041, they were still attempting to find IV sites. At that point, one of the medical team members opened a drawer in the cart, appeared to see that they were running low on supplies. That person left the room, came back with the pocket of his um, sort of scrub style navy blue jacket filled with supplies. When he left, Director T. Walt followed him briefly out of the room and also came back quickly. Um, and that medical team member made an additional trip out to get, I think, one more thing. Um, the supplies were then restocked. They were still attempting um, repeatedly uh, throughout the next several minutes. At 10.54, Mr. Creech lifted his head, looked at the, um, uh, the, the medical team and said, my legs hurt a bit. At that point, they appeared to try to like lift or move his legs to apparently relieve some of that discomfort. Um, Throughout this process, Mr. Creech was looking at the people in his um, witness room. He was sometimes, his arms were strapped, but he was sometimes waving like this or waggling, you know, like wagging his fingers at them. He was sometimes mouthing things to them, um, but he wasn't saying anything loud enough that we could hear it. Um, at 10.57, uh, Warden Richardson and Director T. Walt spoke to each other quietly, nodded, and then um, the warden went and spoke to the uh, medical team. Also at that time, the medical team began removing the EKG. Um, they, um, they left by 10.58, and um, that's when Warden Richardson announced that the execution would be halted because of the inability to find a successful IV site. We were taken out of the room a short time later. Before we left, I saw Director Richardson walk over to Mr. Creech. At one point, he placed his, arm, his hand on his arm. He whispered to him quietly. Then he moved around to the other side of Mr. Creech, where he was on the table so that his back was to the windows and appeared to be talking with him as Creech nodded back. Um, when the warden announced that the execution would be halted, Mr. Creech looked at the people in, his, um, in the separate room, um, his witnesses, and um, waved at them again, and then um, sort of closed his eyes and shook his head. So. 
Hi, I'm uh, Brenda with KTVB. Um, Rebecca did a great job explaining uh, minute by minute, but I'm going to start with uh, when he was brought in, to, uh, in that gurney. It started on time. It started at 10 o'clock. Uh, he was brought in in that gurney. He was still strapped in that gurney, um, and then he was lifted and uh, put on the uh, table, and they covered him with a white blanket. At 10.03, uh, that's when he made eye contact with his family. He waved or to... Uh, his witnesses on that uh, room there. Uh, he waved, and again, like Rebecca mentioned, you, you could just see his, his fingers move there. Um, but he was locked in with his family at 10.03, 10 that is. At 10.04, he actually made contact with us uh, to see who the other witnesses were. He didn't really do, he didn't say anything, he didn't mumble. Um, he just looked at us and, and then just laid back down. That's when the team, the medical team, started the process. They took some uh, breathing assessment. Um, they also put five what they were calling stickers um, on his chest and then two on his abdomen. I did catch at 10.06, he, uh, throughout this whole entire process, he would mumble words, but I was able to catch what he said at 10.06, looking at his family. Um, it appeared that he said, I'm sorry, um, looking at his family again. At 1010, that's when the first IV was administered, and like Rebecca mentioned, it started at the right arm, went over to the left one, and then they had to go uh, take off his shoes and, and proceed with, with his legs. Um, this happened eight times. Um, through each time, though, I did notice that uh, Creech, every time the IV was administered, he would make this uh, snoring no noise. Um, he would also Twitch, what he would appear, it appeared that he would go in and out of his sleep. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned, he, he would twitch and then, and, and snore. Um, there was another point at 10.32 where I was able to make out uh, what he was saying um, to his, his uh, witness room there. It appears that he said, I love you. This was after a couple of attempts at uh, the administering the IV. Um, after that, he went to that, uh, again, to the, the noises, the snoring noises, and um, the, the twitching that he would do. Um, I will also mention, kind of backtracking here, in the room, um, the medical staff, they were covered in white cloth. Uh, they also had goggles, um, and there was uh, about three of them administering this uh, uh, IV. Um, there was a point, the seventh time, uh, where when the IV was administered at 10:54, like Rebecca mentioned, he did say, "My legs hurt a bit." Um, that's when the medical staff helped him lift his legs up. Um, I will also note that from what I could see, from my point of view, um, he didn't seem like he was in pain. The only time that he, he really said he was was at 10.54 when he said, again, quote, my legs hurt a bit. Um, then after that moment, he shook his head. He would shake his head sometimes. I'm just looking at his family. At 10.58, that's when uh, the execution was halted. That's when it was announced. Um, they couldn't find, um, they weren't able to have any successful attempts. Uh, so that's when it was halted. Uh, we were actually told to leave the room. Creech was still laying there on the, the table. Um, and when that announcement was made, from my point of view, he was looking up and Mumbling a couple of words, I didn't make that out, but uh, he would just look up to, to the roof and, and just mumble a couple words there. Um, after that, we were escorted, but uh, he was uh, told a couple of words that we also weren't able to hear, but then we left the room. I'm Scott McIntosh from the Idaho Statesman. I don't have much to add. I will um, corroborate um, what Rebecca Boone said and what Brenda Rodriguez said. 
Um, I also, when um, Mr. Creech came into the room, um, he looked back at his witness room and his eyes started to fill with tears and I heard him sniffling and he seemed to be um, puffing a little bit. And um, I will also uh, say that I could not hear what Mr. Creech said, but based on his lips moving, it looked like he said, I'm sorry. Um, so I will confirm that. Um, the only other thing I'll add is uh, that the medical staff, there were three of them. There was one head person and two assistants. Um, they were dressed in blue scrubs, head to toe, and their faces were covered completely, um, except for their eyes, with white cloth. Um, and then their eyes were covered with um, safety goggles, safety glasses. Um, there was one moment when they were trying to put an IV in his right hand that it seemed like his hand was twitching and hurting. Um, other than that, I will also um, uh, confirm that uh, it did not seem that he was in discomfort or pain um, during that, that hour-long process. Um, other than that, I'll, uh, I'll stand for questions. I'm Roland Barris from Idaho News 6, KIBI-TV, ABC. Um, the other witnesses have given a really good um, rundown of everything that pretty much happened. I, I guess I want to just add a little bit of perspective from what a, a bizarre circumstance this is for anyone to go witness. Uh, I think going into the room, um, seeing someone lifted off of a gurney onto an execution table is just surreal. Um, and then to see the operators in, in the room who, in my opinion, were very professional. Um, again, Creech, to me, did not look like he was in pain at any time, uh, any severe pain. M mild discomfort, I might say, from time to time. Uh, but it is bizarre also to see, as you described, you know, the medical techs with uh, cap on, goggles, face mask, pretty much covered almost head to toe. It's a strange sort of thing to see. At one point, they covered him with a uh, white sheet, and it was kind of bizarre to see how they, it was almost like when you unfurl a flag of some sort, and they did it with a flourish almost. Um, and then he was covered with a white uh, sheet. And I guess I would say just lastly, you know, as, as time went by and, and the, the attempts continued to fail, um, at first, there was very clear communication from the techs, you know, Mr. Creech, and other, you know, this IV attempt has failed. Um, it, you could sense a frustration in the room um, as time went along. And I think I timed it, I don't know about you guys, maybe somewhere around 46, 47 minutes total from the time of the first one, IV. Somewhere around there, uh, 45 to 47 minutes. Uh, it's a long time. Um, 57. About 57 you have? Sure. Um, so, understandably, I think you could uh, see there was some frustration in the room a little bit um, as they tried to get more equipment in and try and try again. Um, and I, I guess I would leave it open to question now, since there's probably going to be some other questions, whether or not there is a certain number that you decide to call it at, or is it just left up to the media, or to the, uh, not to the media, of course, but to the, the medical folks to handle that? Yeah, re real quick, just a couple, uh, <clears throat> couple things to add context. Um, the, the, when Mr. Creech noted discomfort uh, with his leg, uh, he was experiencing a cramp, uh, and, and the medical team uh, worked to try to assuage that. Um, uh, I wasn't sure how briefed everybody was on the timeline, but um, uh, Mr. Creech spent the entirety of the, entirety of the evening uh, up until about a quarter till five this morning uh, with his attorneys as well as his wife, Leanne. Um, uh, he uh, took a mild sedative as he's afforded to do per policy um, and, and actually uh, was able to sleep for at least a little bit. Um, prior to uh, this morning's event. So uh, I think there was, uh, as, as noted, um, uh, 
you know, he, he was uh, very tired um, when, when he was brought into the execution chamber. Uh, in terms of uh, a set number of attempts, uh, we rely on, on the direction of our medical team. Uh, we, ap I met with them after uh, Mr. Preach had, had a physical examination this morning. Um, they, we had established that we, that we thought there were potentially eight access points. Uh, those are the points they attempted to access. Uh, and when it became clear that that wasn't going to be, uh, wasn't going to be successful, uh, that's when the execution was halted. Um, one other thing to note, um, the medical team leader did uh, leave the room um, uh, to gather additional supplies. Um, after the assessment this morning, uh, they had opted to look at smaller gauge catheters to try to establish IV access. Uh, and so it was to, it was to get additional um, smaller gauge catheters uh, for their continued attempts. So with that, any additional questions? I, I wanted to clarify that uh, the state isn't sure what the next steps kind of look like moving forward. I clarify that a little bit. Yeah, uh, I, I think what we've, what we've established right now is that we have a death warrant that expires today. Uh, uh, I, I know, and I apologize, I've been debriefing and some other things, so I'm not as up to speed on the legal maneuvering that's taken place, but I, I believe we have stipulated that we will not make further attempts on this death warrant to try to carry it out. Um, but in terms of in terms of of establishing when to seek another death warrant or if to seek another death warrant, I think those are discussions that have to happen in the days ahead to number one determine whether or not circumstances will be different. Um, or, so those are the kind of things, those are the kind of discussions that, that it would be premature to say this is going to happen next until we have the benefit of having those discussions. In terms of the state protocols, uh, does anything plan for this sort of thing? No, I, from a, a protocol standpoint, we have the, the preferred method is to establish a peripheral line. And that's what they attempted to do and, and finding those access sites. Uh, we have we have concerns about secondary methods that you know this isn't I, I think it's worth noting that this isn't emergency medicine this is a heavily regulated process um, that that requires it be treated with uh, 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 with a, a deference to being mindful of of not violating the Eighth Amendment or creating any cruel and unusual punishment type claims. So uh, where there are other medical procedures that would require surgical intervention or, or something of that nature, um, you know, there are some policies that in other states that allow for that. Um, we're not comfortable with that at this point. Uh, so, but those are the types of things that we're gonna be evaluating in the days ahead to try to determine uh, the path forward. Uh, at this point, Idaho law provides for uh, uh, execution by lethal injection or firing squad now. Uh, we do not have uh, the facilities or physical capabilities of carrying out firing squad. Um, and, and we'll continue to work on, on those efforts. But uh, state law doesn't allow for nitrogen hypoxia, so uh, it would take a change in statute for that to be an option. Uh, but again, uh, our efforts have been focused on carrying out the death penalty under the methods that are prescribed under state law today. Director, is there, is there a time factor with the medication that is involved in this? As you seek a new death pen, uh, warrant, um, is there any concern that it expires or that there's a problem with the, the medication holding up until another attempt? No, no, no concerns. I, I mean, our, our policies are, are pretty strict in, in that, you know, we have uh, certain standards in place uh, to ensure that the, the chemicals that we use are, in fact, the chemicals we're supposed to use, that, that they're not... Uh, that we're not using anything with a beyond use date uh, uh, and that we have testing uh, to verify the, the, the authenticity of those chemicals. And so that it, it, is, it is the same consideration for uh, any execution we undertake. So today's events uh, won't, won't change the calculus on that. There is a timeline, though, where it, can, it does go bad. It does have a, an expiration yeah, at, at some point, yeah, absolutely.
Absolutely, but but again, uh, you know, our our decision making is based on our ability to carry out an execution with dignity, professionalism, and respect, not dates on chemicals. That's a that's a secondary issue. Can you walk us through whether or not the drugs were actually loaded into syringes and whether or not they have now been you know, quote unquote used in, in the longer the yeah, uh, in accordance with our policy, uh, prior to uh, uh, prior to uh, just prior to Mr. Preach entering the chamber, our policy prescribes that those that we have trays that are prepared. So the chemicals that we had uh, for today's execution uh, are mostly they're unusable in future executions. That would be all three doses. If you have a backup, and a backup to the backup. Two of the three. So yep. But uh, potentially, yeah. Was there, there was one in the back. Uh, I, that was my question. Oh, I, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, Freeze is not offered a chance to say final words because the ID was never uh, established. Is that correct? Uh, correct. We we did not get to a, a place in the process where he was afforded that opportunity. Uh, when you say he had physical examination. Assessing his veins? Correct. Uh, yeah, the, the purpose of that examination uh, was for our medical team to assess their uh, their likelihood of being able to establish IV access. And as, as go, ahead. go ahead, sorry, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, and as I noted before, it, it wasn't a simple access issue, it was also a quality issue. Uh, and, and in their professional judgment, and, and I wholeheartedly agree with it, it it uh, it would not have been appropriate to try to move forward with a potential uh, with an IV site that is collapsed or, or with infiltration. So, so following up on uh, the, the backup and so forth, uh, in order to carry out an execution, you would need a backup dose in a future potential execution, correct? Correct. Okay, so two have been used, and my doctor then have one in its possession currently. Uh, correct, but but again, I, I'm not going to speculate on chemicals for future executions. I think we have a, a high level of confidence that we'll be able to secure the chemicals necessary to carry out an execution by lethal injection. Um, uh, but we'll we'll cross that bridge when it's in front of us. But you're talking about an acquisition of additional chemicals. Is that from the same supplier where these ones came from? I will speak about our supplier as often as I always speak about our supplier, and that's to say that I won't speak about our supplier. Fair enough, but it, it, is our understanding correct that you do expect that you'll have to seek out new chemicals um, for another uh, execution attempt? Correct. Okay. You said that there were eight, so like eight attempts, and I believe um, maybe it was Rebecca. Somebody else asked a, a question, um, and that was because there were eight established possible injection sites. Correct. Okay. Uh, is Mr. Creech's wife and is his family still there? I know he's back in his cell. Were they able to have time together afterwards? Yeah, we're, we, uh, uh, as I was leaving IMSI, we were in the process of, of moving Mr. Creech from F block to medical so that his wife could could uh, go back and visit him again. And then uh, the, the facility's making preparations right now on, on his longer term placement. What, what saving after? Uh, I have not had the conversation with him after it failed. Uh, Warden Richardson uh, uh, has a, um, a good rapport with Mr. Creech, and, and he and the warden had a conversation. I'm not aware of the contents of that conversation. Uh, you acknowledge that this execution was unsuccessful. Uh, you said it was wrong to call it a failure. Um, Mr. Creech's attorneys have referred to this as a botched execution. How do you respond? Well, I'll respond to Mr. Creech's attorneys in court, but I, I think from a broader context, you know, what's clear to us and, and what, we, what we rehearse and practice and train uh, is that everything we do is with the goal in mind of ensuring that this process is carried out with dignity, professionalism, and respect. And when it reaches a point in that process at any step where it looks like we're going to be unable to do that, that's when we call it off. And so I, I think uh, for us, it, it wasn't a difficult decision. It was the right decision. 
uh, to halt any future attempts at trying to establish IV access. But let's call it, and, and we'll discuss next steps after that. So I, I think, you know, what what is, um, you know, that that's again our goal is to do this in a in a manner befitting the gravity of such an occasion, uh, such an occasion, and attempting to try to move forward with an execution. Uh, when you don't have the confidence it can be carried out in that respect, I think that would be the definition of a botched execution. Director T. Walt, uh, could you walk us through the level of medical training held by members on the medical team? Are they phlebotomists? Are they EMTs? Or yeah, I, I, I won't get into the specific uh, medical qualifications except to say that the requirements to be a member of our medical team are clearly spelled out in our SOP. Um, which is publicly available, uh, and, and there are regular checks to ensure that they maintain their certifications. I'll go above and beyond that, as I noted before, uh, as a demonstration of our confidence in their competence in what they do. Uh, every single person who's involved in this execution planning process um, has volunteered to have IVs established by this medical team. So while they were unable to establish a suitable uh, IV access point today, uh, our confidence in them is unwavering. We have time for two more questions. Okay, mine's kind of a double header. So has, as far as you know, this has never happened in the state of Idaho before? Correct. Okay. And has anybody on the medical team ever performed an execution before? Yes. They have. In Idaho? Correct. Okay. So they have a history of doing so. Yeah. Okay. One last question then. Um, I've always heard that when you're under an attack, if you will, your veins shut down because the external veins will sort of collapse in order to protect you from attack. It's a natural thing that occurs. Um, it, doesn't it make it problematic when you're fearful for your life that you're about to die, that the veins will be difficult to find? You are asking me to weigh into an area where I have zero expertise. So I, I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't necessarily comment on, on that uh, respect, um, except to, to note you know, the qualifications that are in our SOP, um, you know, these medical team members are, as a routine course of their work, uh, are, are used to dealing in high stress, high pressure, high stake situations. Um, and, and, you know, again, we're confident in their abilities, but I can't speak to uh, how the circumstances may have affected Mr. Creech or the quality of his veins today. All right, that was Josh Tewalt, the director of IDOC, up on that stage with the witnesses, the media witnesses, including our Brenda Rodriguez, to this execution that did not move forward. Um, the medical team kept anonymous here. We've learned there were eight attempts, eight different sites on the body where they could attempt to get this line, mm -hmm. and they were unable to do so. But they say it's an, it was an access issue at first, and then a vein quality issue with yeah. him. So essentially, there were a few times where they could not find a vein, yes. other times where they found a vein, but it wasn't of high enough quality. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the problem with that is it wouldn't be able to carry those lethal injection drugs out efficiently enough that they could not guarantee that Mr. Creech would not uh, experience pain and suffering. Um, which would, of course, violate the U.S. Constitution that guarantees no cruel and unusual punishment, which is also why IDOC Director T. Walt there said that he is not calling this a botched execution, even though that's what we've heard from Mr. Creature's mm -hmm. lawyers. He said botching would be an execution carried out without dignity and respect, and he believes that ensuring that, uh, again, Creech did not suffer um, during this execution means that uh, they were providing that dignity and respect, mm -hmm. and so they had to call that off. And, you know, Justin, he was very honest, saying they really don't know what the next steps are right now. They're going to take the next few days to kind of figure it out. Our Morgan Romero live there right now, and uh, we're going to check in with her in just a minute. But once again, Creech is back in his cell. We've learned he did get to spend some time with his family. I'm not sure if they're still together at this time. 
but uh, Tawalt very honest about really not knowing what they're going to do next. Yeah, and there was a question of, are you going to try again? at a later point. Um, what does this mean for the case or cases against Mr. Creech? He said, those are, uh, we're gonna figure that out in later discussions that, that will happen you know, in the next few days. He did say also that they would need more lethal injection chemicals, that yes. they had prepared enough of it today that all of those syringes that they provided no longer viable, so they would have to get more chemicals if indeed another death warrant was issued. And once again, Morgan asked the question, is this unprecedented? Yes, yeah. it is. Also, did the medical team have experience on other executions? She got the answer, yes, they did. So Morgan, tell us your thoughts about what you're hearing from T. Walt. Yeah, very shocking. The director of the Department of Correction just spoke in addition to the media witnesses, including our Brenda Rodriguez, uh, explaining what happened. He said that there were eight unsuccessful attempts to locate a vein, not just locate a vein, but a, a one that would be viable as well, right, uh, in order to inject this lethal injection drug into Mr. Creech. And they, uh, according to protocol, assessed the situation and they decided that they were no longer going to do this. I heard you guys mentioned they try to do these executions uh, with respect and dignity for the person for which they are performing them on. And they said at that point they decided that they weren't going to go forward. And so that death warrant for Mr. Creech is expiring at 11.59 p.m. today. And he was very honest, saying he didn't know next steps. He didn't know what they were going to do, whether they were going to issue another death warrant. But two of the three lethal doses that they had of that drug uh, are no longer viable. They were loaded up into syringes. They were set forth to be used and uh, they are no longer able to use those moving forward. So it's, it's unclear. Idaho does have a law where you can execute somebody by firing squad, but he didn't go so far as saying that they would uh, make an effort on that next or whether they would move forward with lethal injections. He said it's just too premature to speculate at this point. I'm going to bring in Brenda now. Brenda, you were asked to share uh, your experience this morning, kind of from 10 o'clock, a little bit earlier than that, when he was set to be executed until the moment they decided this wasn't going to happen. Walk us through moment by moment as much as you can remember. Yeah, well, I'm going to start from the moment that Creech came in and everything did start right on time, right at 10 o'clock. Um, he was brought in in a gurney. He was strapped in. He had uh, three uh, main straps just along his body. Then he was lifted on to the execution table. Um, that's where they just uh, unfolded a, a sheet, a blanket um, to just put that over him. Um, he was wearing Crocs, like mm -hmm. orange Crocs-looking uh, shoes. Uh, just like you mentioned, eight of them have been confirmed, eight attempts. They started with the right arm and went over to the left before they had to go uh, take his shoes off and then try to do that on, on his legs. Um, Throughout though the each attempt though I did notice that he would make these uh, sn uh, snoring noises mm -hmm. and then he would twitch. It would s almost like he went in and out of sleep. Um, but from the moment he walked in and he locked eyes with uh, his, the room where his witnesses are and uh, you could just hear him mumble words. I was able to make out a couple of those but before the first attempt which happened at 10, uh, 11, um, he just looked over at his family and said, I'm sorry. Um, so it was very interesting to see all of this play out, his reaction. But I will say, though, Morgan, um, he did look a little nervous when, mm. we, when he was brought into the room. And it is important to note uh, the medical individuals, there are three of them, sort of one that was leading it, as well as two other folks. Uh, they have a list of qualifications. Director Tewal wouldn't go over those today, but he did say, again, that they have performed executions in the state of Idaho before. They have experience with intravenous drugs. Well, I will add to that, though, being in there from my point of view, the medical staff, um, they looked a little shaky. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there was uh, some nervous uh, actions there, but um, I did notice that they were shaking. And Roland Barris from Channel 6 saying they appeared frustrated, yeah. too. There was some frustration in the room. A lot more to unpack here uh, from the execution that did not go forward. T. Walt calling it unsuccessful. Uh, Creech's attorneys calling it botched and failures. So uh, we will continue to cover this story later on the news at 4, the news at 5, 6, 
and 10, as well as on KTVB.com. For now, though, we will send it back to you, Maggie and Justin. All right. Thank you so much for your hard work out there, Morgan, and, of course, Brenda Rodriguez, who was a witness to what happened. Idaho's longest-serving death row inmate was not executed today. The medical team tasked with carrying out that execution could not find a vein to insert an IV to administer the lethal drugs. And when they did, they say vein quality was an issue. The attempt came after the U.S. Supreme Court actually denied a stay or delay just two hours before the execution was scheduled. It was the latest effort by Creech's defense team to get his execution delayed or stopped completely. Creech on death row now for nearly 50 years. The death warrant will expire, and it's unclear if another one will be made. They were very honest about really not knowing what the next steps are. IDOC was. Shortly after the execution, Creech's legal team filed a motion to stay the execution, calling it botched. And then that news conference held shortly after they decided to stop the execution, where the witnesses, including our Brenda Rodriguez, spoke about their experiences. We're going to hear more from Brenda and have the latest from what happened coming up on the news at 4. You can also visit KTVB.com and the KTVB app anytime for the latest updates on this. Again, the execution of Thomas Creech not going forward this morning.